Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have, have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are given as baptized Christians to see the entire world as it really is. But this sight does not come to you by your physical eyes, but through God's word and spirit-given faith. Your physical eyes actually deceive you because they see only as your flesh and blood can know. So you look and you see a damned sinner or a self-righteous saint, whether you look at yourself or around at your neighbor, but neither vision is the truth, or at least nothing more than, at best, the half-truth. If you see as the flesh sees, you will only see corruption. If you look with eyes towards justice and law, you will despair for today and tomorrow. Or as one of you asked before a church that we pray for our country. Again, looking with our eyes, it seems there is no hope. And if you keep looking, even further afield, you will see only a damnable world full of murder, adultery, unchastity, theft, slander, libel, greed, and worse. With our eyes, it appears that every, everything and everyone is under demonic sway, corrupt and corrupting. Even churches offer no clarity of purpose or future, any way out, a different vision. But again, you are given as baptized Christians to see the entire world as it actually is. The sight does not come through your physical eyes, but through God's word and spirit-given faith. When you look around with eyes of faith, enlightened by the gospel, instead you see sinners, yes, but sinners for whom Christ died. You see neighbors whom Jesus gave you to love with his love. You see a world desperately needing Christ's blood-bought grace, mercy, and peace. Your physical eyes cannot see this. Only eyes lit up by the gospel of Jesus can. And so it seems these eyes are opposed to one another. And of course, you know that the flesh is opposed to the spirit. You will always see things in two ways. First, according to the law, which shows you and your neighbor's sin and it's hopeless, despairing. And also then, with eyes of faith, according to the gospel, which sees your sins forgiven and forgiving your neighbor's sins. It doesn't take a word from God to see all the wrongdoing and corruption and even death that's in ourselves and in our neighbor. Just an honest reflection sees that. We have the law written on our hearts and it reveals that truth, the truth of the law, just fine. But even then, we have a kind of adaptive blindness to our own sin and then a hypersensitive vision to our neighbor's faults. We're good at avoiding our own guilt and heaping shame upon our neighbor. But God won't have it because that's not the truth. Even though the law is written on our hearts, we still deceive ourselves and that truth is not in us. So God spoke the law in all its severity on Sinai so that neither you nor your neighbor have any excuse. When the law of God speaks, sin increases beyond measure so that all are declared captive, enslaved, guilty. And if that were the last word, then we'd be just like the man in the ditch, stripped naked, robbed of anything in what we could trust, and left for dead. Exactly probably what we deserved. The sad truth is that we and everyone else in that mass grave deserve to be there. God has revealed this truth so that you do not deceive yourself, so that you know what is really real, that you see yourselves truthfully according to the flesh, Sinners without a hope or prayer. But God didn't stop speaking. 
Indeed, long before Sinai, before that law in its full severity was spoken, he spoke a word of promise, the promised seed who would crush the serpent's head, the seed in whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed, the seed in whose fellow brothers and sisters would be more numerous than the stars of heaven and the sand on the shore. That word of promise predates even the foundation of the world. That promise overcomes what your flesh sees, what your physical eyes can see, or even what God's law has revealed. The gospel promise of Christ crucified for forgiveness is the only answer for the desperate sinner whose conscience is tormented, for a damnable world full of murder, adultery, unchastity, theft, slander, libel, greed, corruption, and worse. Because where there is forgiveness, there is life and salvation. Jesus is at work to care for all of you. Yes, your soul with forgiveness, but your body too. He promises to never leave you or forsake you so that nothing, not sins or death or devils, can tear you away from his gracious love. And this perfect love that casts out fear is given to you as a gift, not by merit, and there is no worthiness needed, because everything for life and salvation is freely and graciously given to you and to all who believe. So your baptized eyes see this as what is real. You don't just see as mere physical eyes see. So even today you see upon, or the Lamb of God upon his altar throne, who has come to give his body and blood to you. You see Jesus standing in your midst, forgiving your sins. Your baptized eyes see Jesus washing you with water, absolving and cleansing. These eyes see Jesus in the pulpit, proclaiming his word, who alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And when your eyes now see that, then you will also see everything and everyone around you differently. You see, brothers and sisters, all reborn and adopted by water and the word. Just look around. That's who's with you today. You see a family rooted and grounded in Christ's love. You see your fellow kin who are yours to love and care for, not by human blood, but by divine promise. You see a family gathering of dysfunctional sinners, yes, but living together by the atoning blood of Christ. As far as Jesus is concerned, we were all once rebels and his enemy, but now he has made us his friends and brothers by his grace, by dying to redeem us. That's here, but if you continue to look even farther afield, you'll see even more with these eyes of faith. You'll see neighbors, be they friends or foes, by flesh, whom Jesus died for and has given to be recipients of his grace, mercy, peace, hope, life, salvation, and resurrection, too. There's no distinction or judgment that you can ever let get in the way of Christ Jesus using you as instruments of his love. Again, be your neighbor, friend, or foe. That could be the annoying neighbor next door whose every action gets on your nerve. Forgive, love, and be patient and gracious with him, just as Jesus is with you. And the possibilities to love are as numerous as there are sinners and a sinful world. You have uh, a few inserts as well as some other bulletin announcements of those within our congregation and those nearby and even those far afield who need your love and care. Love begins with prayer because all true prayer is grounded in God's word, revealing and forgiving sin. And then from there, you see the world differently with love. Your neighbor could be a coworker who is impossible to work with and doesn't really even deserve the job. Forgive her without limit, with undeserved charity. Your neighbor could be Russian aggressors or Ukrainian oligarchs. Both sides, so to speak, need Jesus to bring peace, a lasting peace that only forgiveness of sins can give. Your neighbor could be those incarcerated, maybe even January 6th insurrectionists who are rotting in jail with no due process or speedy trial 
with exaggerated charges and are neglected and dejected. These fellow citizens are your neighbors who need loving care. Advocacy, money, letters to Congress, or even just care packages for their family and children. However you feel about what they did doesn't even matter any more than it mattered for the Samaritan who found the man in the ditch. What the courts rule is even irrelevant. They and their families need absolution and love. Just to name a few examples, these opportunities are endless. I'm sure you've probably thought of others who your conscience has pricked, who need your love too already. But of course you ask, how could we love them all? How could we possibly do that? There must be some limit, some constraint. Who is my neighbor? You think that no one has the time or the resources or facilities or patience or even the means to do even a little for all those in need, never mind everything they need. You can't even see how that's possible. How could it be possible that you could love in such a way, freeless, free and boundless? But of course, that makes you just like the lawyer that came to Jesus, who can think only according to the law, only as his eyes can see. And there you are, thinking according to your flesh again. It's right at hand, always ready to tempt. Setting limits on, on love and making excuses, well, really so you could just be negligent. But why? You have eyes of faith, you've been baptized, you know that the Lord always provides love abounding. So look around and see with eyes of faith. You have a cup overflowing with grace and mercy. You have a spring of waters that never dries up. You have a tree whose fruit is always in season. You have Jesus, your Jesus, whose compassion for you and for those he has given you to love never ceases and never runs out. And so today, Jesus is here first to care for you, to bind up your wounds, to heal you of your sin and rebellion, to carry you on his shoulders here into his holy inn, and to care for you. His mercies never cease, thanks be to God. And then you won't cease to love either. Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you have seen. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We stand to sing the offertory.